The, the story of Christmas is the most incredible story ever told in the history of the universe. The Christmas story is really about God's cosmic plan to provide for mankind and restore relationship with mankind. It, it began in, in heaven. It touched earth, and now it's fulfilled in your life. This is not just, you know, a fireside chat story. This is the most incredible, powerful, life-giving story that anyone has ever heard, that if you're able to understand it, that it will literally get in you, begin to change you, and that your life now will be different than the life you had before if you could understand this Christmas story. It's an incredible act of an incredible God that loved his people when they didn't deserve it. And the truth of this story is that the Christmas story is the greatest act of generosity that humankind has ever seen. It is the greatest act of generosity that the universe has ever witnessed. It's truly, truly incredible, God's generosity to us through the ages. It began with Adam and Eve and and you know how the story goes. Adam and Eve were, were given this garden and given this realm, and they had relationship, partnership with God. And, and, uh, and, and the, the snake came and tempted Eve, and she ate of the apple, gave it to, uh, of, the, of the fruit, gave it to Adam. And, and he did the same. And because uh, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they, they committed the one act that God charged them not to do. Because that's what sin is. Sin is, is doing the thing that God uh, has charged you to stay away from. It, it, sin sin is, is being disobedient to God's laws. And, and the very first humans ever lived were disobedient to God's laws, and that caused a separation between God and man. But what's so amazing is, is God himself, even in this act, the Bible says that they, they realized that they were naked and they became ashamed, that God himself began to clothe them, because this is all about God. He's the one that in their shame began to clothe them because, because, because he's, uh, and, and, and he promises, he promises that, that, through, uh, that through the seed of the woman would come salvation and restoration. Like the moment sin enters, so a promise enters. Because that's how God works. The moment you screw up, here comes the promise of grace. And, 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 and then the promise is affirmed time and again throughout history. And, and through Abraham, God shows up and reveals himself to Abraham. What did Abraham do to deserve this revelation? Nothing. He's just sitting there and God shows up and says, Abraham, I am going to be your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And I will make the, your children like the sands on the seashore. All nations will be blessed through you. And Abraham says, sounds good. <laughs> it was God that was generous to Abraham. And, and, and then God says, now I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him for me. And Abraham does the unthinkable but follows God's promise and is about to sacrifice his son, but God stops his hand. And Abraham uh, lifts up his uh, eyes, and there's a, a sacrifice, a goat. But he says in Genesis chapter 22 that God himself will provide the final sacrifice. And you can read that two ways. You can read it like God will provide for for himself the final sacrifice, or you can read it, God himself will provide. In other words, he will provide himself as the sacrifice. And, and, and so prophet after prophet comes and they begin to speak about this lamb, perfect spotless lamb that God is going to send as a sacrifice for our sin, to restore the relationship that humankind broke with God. And, 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 and promise after promise and prophecy after prophecy is spoken over the people of Israel saying he's coming. The Messiah is coming. The one that's going to restore you to God is coming. The one that's going to stand in the gap is coming. And Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, they prophesy about this coming king. And then for 400 years, there's silence that God does not send another prophet. There, there's silence in the land, but in the midst of that silence, God sends a star. And what I love is the fullness of the gospel is found really in the Christmas story. You see, light is indicated. It, it, it's like in the beginning, there was only darkness and void, but God spoke and said, let there be light. And, and, and after the fall, God had to, the darkness came back on the, on the world but, but, and void, but God speaks again and says, I'm sending another light. And, and this star is, is, is like 
it's like a, an example to the world. What I think is so amazing is this star shone not over one tribe or one tongue or one nation. It shone over the whole world. It was an example that Jesus was coming for all. And the people in the Far East were able to look up at the star and realize this is a message that something is about to change on the earth. And when God came, he announced it. To, to shepherds and, and, and just people in the field. He, he went to the nobodies to tell them of the greatest act that humanity has ever seen. It, it, it was God that was generous to mankind all along. It was all God. Look at this story. Man messed up and God took over. Man messed up and God took over. And he promised and he provided and he moved and he brought change all the way leading up to Jesus. And, and here Jesus is the ultimate act of God providing for mankind. And, and Jesus began his ministry. And, and one night, a man named Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, who are you? Never seen anyone like you. We can't figure it out. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? Because no one can do what you do and not be sent by God. The Pharisees couldn't figure it out because you don't look like the one. You don't act like the one. You don't talk like the one we've been waiting for. But there's something undeniable about you. And that's where Jesus gives this incredible revelation. Not to a giant crowd. You would think John 3.16 would be preached to the most amount of people. But it was preached at night to one man. And God reveals, Jesus reveals God's plan to humankind. He explains God's plan of generosity. And he says, he says this, that it was God that loved the world. It was God that gave his son. It was God that desired that all people should be saved. It was God that desires that you shouldn't perish. It was God that sent his son not to condemn, but that the whole world through him might be saved. Grace is all about God. It's all from God. The Christmas story, it's all about God. It's all initiated from God. And here Jesus explains God's great plan of generosity to us with these three simple points out of, out of John 3.16. It's, it's this, God initiated relationship, God loved mankind, and it was God that gave to us. That's God's plan of generosity. Look, it was God that initiated. It was God that came after you. It was God that showed up in your life like you were Abraham, done nothing. And God says, I'm here now, and I'm about to change your life. And what's beautiful is God allows the time and the process. You don't serve a shy God, and you don't serve a God that doesn't know you. He knows everything you did, yet still chooses to love you fully. This is incredible generosity. I was speaking to the ALC students this week. We had a, a conversation on relationships, a Q&A. And they asked uh, Samantha and I, they said, how do you tell someone how you like them? And I said, what is wrong with this generation? <laughs> you know, you, you send a note. I like you. Do you like me? <laughs> Circle yes, you know, or no. <laughs> and I, I really, I didn't have much of an answer. I was like, I don't know, the old-fashioned way. You'd send your friend to do some scouting. I don't know. <laughs> I want you to know something about God. God is not like that timid and shy in the corner of the room, wanting to be friends, wanting to say, hey, I, I, I want to have a relationship. That, that is not God. God is the one that looked down and said, they need help, and stepped into the earth. And he said, I am here. And he came boldly for you. He came courageously for you. He did not even come in, in a quiet way. Yes, he came in a manger, but he had a star to proclaim is coming. It was all God. It was not you that came to the end of yourself and said, I think I'm ready to see what God has for me. You were doing your own thing. You were lost. You were flailing. You were drowning. And thank God, he's the one that decided thousands of years ago, I'm going to provide for them. I'm going to come after them. I'm going to seek them. I'm going to love them. Like, it was all God. You couldn't have gotten to God if you tried. You cannot work your way towards God. And, and, and sometimes, even after we get saved, we have a hard time shaking that mentality that we think if we can do, 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 then God will love, love, love. But I'm here to tell you, God loves, 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 despite what you do, do, do. The reality is you don't, don't, don't. And he so loves, so loves, so loves. Thank God it's all on him. Because if it was all on us, we'd be in trouble. 
a lot of trouble. But some of us are, we, we, we try and work at it. It's like you're going to work every day and, and grinding 60 hours a week to pay a mortgage that you don't owe. God says, I've paid this price. I've done the work. I've completed it. It's amazing. God says it is good in the beginning. It is good. It is good. It is good. But you know what he never says? He never says it's complete. It's good. It's good. But it's not yet complete. But when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. All of creation was waiting for Jesus to show up and say, I have done the final work in your life. We just got to remember who he is to us. Because so many times we can get caught up in our failure and our sin and think, well, could God ever accept someone like me? I've got good news for you. He already accepted someone like you before you ever even sinned. He had a plan of provision that he put into place for you. Think about this. For thousands of years, God was planning to provide for you. For thousands of years, he was planning to provide for your children and your family. He is a good God. He is a generous God. He initiated. He came after you. When you could not have even known of him to come after him, he says, I'm going to cross this gap that, that, that they could never cross. He initiated. And you know what's amazing is he initiated. Why? Because he loved. It's not like God created us. And when we got separated from him, he says, I'm going to come get them. And then I'm going to show them who's really boss. I'll show them. That's not his motivation. It's pretty amazing because he is God. And it could have been his motivation. His motivation could have been to come and get you in line. But Jesus says, no, let me tell you about God's great plan. It's motivated by love. It's not even motivated by your work or your effort. No, it's motivated by his own love for you. It doesn't even make sense. It's extravagant. It's over the top. You know, we sing that song, Reckless. It's relentless love. It is extravagant love that he has for you despite you. It's all him. It's amazing. In, in, in ancient times, any God that man would make, it was man that would form the God. It was man that would put the God up on a pedestal, and it was man that would serve the God. But, but with our God, the one true God, he says, you have no part of this process yet. I'm the one that was. Before Abraham was, I am. Before anyone was, I am. I'm the one that came after you, and I'm the one who loved you. He did all of it. So our worship doesn't it's not initiated by us. It's a response to his great love for us. It's amazing because it comes against the lie that you're undeserving of his love. It comes against the lie that God's angry at you. And you know, maybe that's not so much the lie that you believe anymore. It seems like, it seems like this generation doesn't necessarily struggle with God being angry at them. It seems like this generation struggles more with God being uninterested in them. If he really is God, he's got more important things, and I certainly don't deserve to be noticed by him. But you've got to understand, you're not just loved. You're so loved. For God was so obsessed with you. For God so valued you. It's all God. It's all from him. He's so loved. He so desired you. The, the word here is actually the Greek word agape. And agape is... is is a picture of selfless, sacrificial, over-the-top love. Agape, the word is used when you see the true value in something, even if other people don't see it. The, the word agape is, is a, a type of love that, that causes you to literally begin to have, to hold um, the subject of the love in high esteem. To, to have admiration for it. The type of agape love means you wonder over this thing. Can you believe that? That that's the word that Jesus chooses to use, use towards you? He's saying, for God so valued you. So God so held you in high esteem. He wondered over you. He's not against us. He doesn't hate us. He's not anti you. He's not trying to repay you. You know, for all the sin you did, he agapes you. You know, when, and when you go to buy a Christmas gift, there is a correlation between your relationship and how much you're going to spend. Have you noticed that? 
And, uh, and, you, and, and with certain people, you better spend that right amount. <laughs> it, it, it's like when God looked down at you, he says, how I value you? Like, like to, 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 to see how much God values your relationship, you need to see what he spent. And Jesus, the Bible says, gave his everything. Right? The Bible says you were bought with a high price. The price was the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus valued you so much. He says, I will spill the most, the most worthwhile thing on the planet, the blood of God himself. He gave up his life for your life. That's how much he loves you. It's for you. He values you. It is all him to you. Come on, can we thank God? for how good he is. Now, you were bought with a high price. You were bought with a high price. Some of you think, no, I was in the back corner, all dusty, for sale, on the sale rack, last year's item. But that's not what God says. He says, I paid the highest price for your life. I came after you. And you might say, well, I'm not worth it. Well, his blood says you are worth it. Because he's so loved that he so gave. It was God all the way. He so loved that what did he do? He gave. And, and, and it's, it's amazing when you talk about the Christmas story that you have to connect it to the crucifixion story. It's like he was born to die. His mission on earth was to die. And his whole life, like we all know we're born and one day we will die. But he was born to die. And his whole life, everything he did was leading up towards this death where he was going to give his life in exchange for your life. It's amazing that it was God that came to give to you. We think sometimes as Christian, I just got to sacrifice, I got to give to God. Yes, but he sacrificed and gave to you. Like, let's make sure we have it in the right order. He's the one that came. He's the one that loved. He's the one that gave. Period. Everything else is a response to that. And, and, then, and then the Bible even opens it up and says, uh, he gave grace and truth and abundant life. Listen, he gave truth that you might transform. You do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That happens when you add truth into your mind. God gave you truth that you might have wisdom. God gave you truth that you might be able to change. God gave you truth that he might confront you and, and begin to work on you and begin to mold you. In other words, wherever he finds you is not where he's going to leave you. He found you in a ditch, but by the end, you're going to end up in a palace. This is, this is what God's design was for you. And, and you know what's cool about God is he's one of the few people that will tell you the truth. I mean the real truth. You know what's amazing about God is he will tell you some of the meanest things and you know he loves you. Because truth is like a sword. It begins to divide things. But there are some things in your life that need to be divided. And he lovingly comes and begins to apply the sword of truth and cut those reactions out of your life. Cut that old way of thinking out of your life. Come on, he comes and he cuts that bondage out of your life. He cuts those lies out of your life. He says, I've got some things i got to get rid of. But he doesn't just take things away. He adds things to you. He gives you grace, favor, promotion. I love it. He gives you truth to show you where you screwed up, but grace to cover the screw-ups. He, he's got the whole plan. And the fulfillment of this is abundant life. That the world might not be condemned, but through him, you might be saved. This was God's great plan of generosity all along to you and I. That's what Christmas is all about. It's, it's all about God being extremely, extravagantly, over-the-top generous to you before you ever even existed. Romans says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. When you were stuck in your own stuff, God still died for you. He loved you all the way through. And, 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 and what's amazing about this is, is God did all of this through his son. He, he gave through Jesus Christ on the cross. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God had this whole plan in mind that you might be saved when you believe in Jesus. It, 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 the, the, the problem was there, 
there was a separation between God and man, so God sent himself as a man. Jesus was the God-man, the bridge between God and humanity. And when he sacrificed himself, he was able to restore relationship between us and God. And that's what we live in right now, a wide-open relationship between us and God. But it had to take the sacrifice of Jesus. Grace needed a conduit. Salvation had to flow through something. And Jesus says, let it flow through my life. And, and so we've received life and, and grace and truth through Jesus. God's generosity came through his son. And, and that's what God does. It, it's he partners with humanity. We see it in the garden. We see God partner with Adam. But after that partnership was broken, God said, I, I want to restore it. So he sends his own son. Why? To restore relationship and partnership again. And, and so... So the story doesn't end with God just being generous to us. It begins to turn, and now once our relationship is stored with God, he says, now I want to partner with you. Don't forget in John 1, it says that, that, um, that God, uh, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God. In other words, when you get reconnected with God, he gives you his DNA. He begins to welcome you into the family. You're not out there wandering on your own. You're now a child of the Most High. And what does that mean? It means how God is going to work through you like he worked through Jesus. Let me tell you the truth. God wants to partner with you to pour his generosity out through you like he did through Jesus for the whole world. Jesus says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now I give it to you. Go. Go into all the world, make disciples, teach people, baptize the nations, show them what it looks like to follow me. And so God's great generosity, this incredible act, now we get to be a part of this story. And here's the reality, here's the model. The model is God partners with people to pour out his generosity. He poured it out through Jesus, but now you are a son or a daughter, and now he's going to begin to pour out his generosity through you. I guess what I'm saying is, at the end of the year, going into the next, what does God want to do through us? I know what he did for us, but what does God want to do now through us? Because don't, don't make the mistake of thinking God did all this generosity for you to sit there and say, so good, and then go and live a selfish life. No, he did all of this to rescue us that we might be a part of the rescue effort that God has on planet Earth. And so, New Life Church, I, I've got to ask this question is what does he want to do through us? Because if he had this plan, this universal plan to rescue us, it has got to be for a reason. And, and I've got a vision for this next year, for our church, and I believe we are called to be an over-the-top, extravagant, generous church. One of our core values is generosity is our lifestyle. I pray that that gets so in us because it came to us and through us because he first was generous to us. See how it's connected? We're not generous because we've decided. We're generous because he's decided. And now we get to have this be a part of who we are. Listen, I believe this. I believe we are blessed to be a blessing. And, and let me ask you this. If God poured out into your life today, you know like how you pray? If God really answered that prayer and just began to pour out extravagantly into your life, whose life would also get poured into? I believe you're blessed to be a blessing. God's not going to pour into you if you are not going to continue his model of being generous through people. God's saying, this is how I did it with Jesus. I was generous through him. Can I be generous through you? Come on, I want us to be a church that God can be generous through. To people who are in desperate need. I pray God can be generous through you so that it literally begins to hit people all around you. Listen, I want to challenge you. I believe we as a church are called to be the most generous people on the planet. Can you say amen? amen. I believe we're called to be the most generous people on the planet because it was God that gave to us and now God's going to give through us. I, I hope you have a needs radar in your life. I hope you have a radar going that if someone has a need, they better not mention it near you, even in passing, because if you capture that need, you're going to do something about it. Come on, I'm going to, I'm going to show Jesus to this person now. I, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to have an overflow of generosity in my life. You see, you guys are getting uptight now, I can tell. You think I'm going to take an offering at the end of this sermon. 
I can see it. I'm not going to. What I'm trying to say is he was the generous one to you. It was all him. Because we sometimes think generosity is from ourselves. It's not. It's from him. When you, when you get his spirit on you, you get a generous spirit on you. I pray you have a generous spirit, not a stingy spirit. Nobody wants to be around a stingy spirit. You know, Proverbs says that the person that gives gifts always has a lot of friends. That can go two ways. But what's it saying is everybody wants to be around a generous person. I believe we have a grand opportunity right now to be a generous church unlike this city and this, this state has ever seen. Do you know that um, the statistics for generosity show that the more you're generous, the more you feel good about yourself? And that do you know that giving, the act of giving, literally fights the scarcity mindset in your own life? Psychologists call it the scarcity mindset. We would call it the poverty mindset. But with every act of giving, you literally begin to declare, I've got more than enough. See, we think that God's going to give to us out of need. We say, God, I have a need, therefore give. But that's not the way it works. Jesus says, give, and it will be given unto you. Come on, press down, shaken together, running over, more than enough. I want to be generous through you. I pray in this next year we are a generous church. Because that's how God was so generous to us. You look in the book of Acts. It says in, in Acts chapter 4, it, it says God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. I pray God's grace is so powerfully at work in this church that we're able to care for each other. I pray we, in this next year, we, we're even more generous as a community to our community. You know, I, I heard a story of uh, one of the members of a, of a on the A-team, wasn't able to buy toys for their children for Christmas. So the other people on that team gathered together to buy toys for that person's kids for Christmas. Come on, that's what the church should look like. I've been hearing stories about radical generosity in the church. People giving cars to people, people offering jobs to people. I've, I've been hearing about people who have uh, um, spouses serving you know, in, in foreign lands, people are coming over mowing lawns and, and, and shoveling snow for these people. I'm telling you, that is what Jesus would do. I pray that's on us. An extreme, generous spirit. I'm not just talking about your tithe. I'm talking about a generous spirit. I'm talking about giving to each other. I'm talking about if you have a coat and your friend needs one, you're able to give that other coat to your friend. I'm talking about us not avoiding opportunities to give, but us searching it out. The Bible says that, that, that we should make strategic plans to be generous and stand in that generosity. I'm praying that that's the kind of church we're going to be. And as we're generous, we're going to reflect God's generosity to us amongst each other. And I believe we're going to stand as an example to the world. Can you say amen, church?